Welcome everybody to the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory. We are uh, underway, well underway in our uh, Cygnus summer series. And tonight we have asteroid occultations, but uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Want to give you some of our background. The Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory is a not-for-profit organization uh, focusing on uh, astronomy outreach uh, to communities, students, and uh, folks all over. Uh, we, we really love what we do and enjoy uh, having folks join us for these and other events. As I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, public observing programs on Friday nights and then uh, some additional programs. Uh, throughout the course of the week if, uh, if there's a particularly special event. We offer private stargazing parties for, uh, for a small fee, but uh, you can see there there's a, a mom and dad and their high school son in that picture. Uh, but we, we've had parties, uh, you know, 15 or so folks, and uh, we've had uh, parties of two. That's, that's always a lot of fun. Uh, we take our portable planetarium to school districts in the area and uh, give them a, uh, a, a planetarium style view of the night sky right during the school day. And that's gotten a lot of traction. We've actually started doing that right at the Knights of Columbus Hall here in Tupper Lake. And we do some other outreach to schools uh, in, uh, for other programs as well. In our classroom, right at the uh, office here on High Street, we have uh, all sorts of programs for kids, after school programs and um, summer type programs. Uh, this was a, a beginner telescope, uh, how the basic telescope works uh, class. So that's always a lot of fun for kids and camps. We have our campers come in as well. Uh, on September 1st, we'll be hosting a special online panel discussion uh, about the James Webb Space Telescope and where the future will, uh, will be for us uh, with, that, uh, with those new discoveries and, and the uh, uh, new images we're seeing has unraveled a lot of questions uh, about, uh, about our place in the universe. And I hope to have some very engaging conversation uh, about that on September 1st. Look for more details uh, coming soon. And of course, finally, our astrophotography conference is back this year. We've had a two year hiatus due to COVID, uh, but this is a great event uh, for those of you that are interested in astrophotography. Uh, it is a hand over hand uh, coaching style um, so that you're not left out in the cold dark trying to uh, find YouTube videos to help uh, you figure out why your guiding is not working correctly. or um, And then we go and we process the images. So a uh, four-day event for uh, only $300. It's a great uh, experience and it's gaining traction. Uh, this also has become somewhat international. We have regularly uh, people from all over the country here, but um, from South America, from Central America. Um, we're, we're yet to break ground overseas, but... I feel that coming in the not so distant future also. If you haven't heard, we have an eclipse headed our way on April 8th, 2024. Uh, Tupper Lake, New York is the uh, uh, central point of the um, totality. So we're looking at some, uh, some great events scheduled for that day. If you haven't made reservations yet, I hear from the hotel uh, owners in town and motel owners in town that their rooms are already booking for that event uh, two years out. So uh, consider coming up to Tupper Lake for that. Um, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun. Uh, in construction news, we have that south side of the observatory uh, has been a, a field, an observing field, and now it will be a formal observing, um, we'll, we'll call it a patio, but uh, an observing area that it will be paved with stamped concrete, with lighting, with benches, and um, uh, just a lot safer and more humane experience for those that come to our Friday night events. So look for that uh, sometime this fall. Mark, uh, Mark Staves here is heading up that project. So we look for good things not so far down the road. And if you haven't heard, um, we, we were talking about a $17 million project uh, last year at this time. We've 
pared that project down to two separate phases. And we are concentrating only right now on the planetarium phase, the first phase of it, uh, the planetarium. And we expect that to be, uh, you know, between a three to five million dollar project for that phase. And it will include, of course, a, uh, a dome, uh, an interior dome uh, planetarium with seating for about 65 or so. But additionally, we will uh, include a classroom um, in that that can be used as a, a, a lecture hall, a multi-purpose room. Uh, we can host all sorts of events in there. So between the planetary and the classroom, uh, we'll have our offices there. We'll be able to host plenty of different events um, right on our own property. And that is coming literally right where it was originally planned on the same site as the observatory is currently, um, just uh, just 100 feet away from the, the current observatory. So we'll be unique. We'll have a planetarium and an observatory on the same site right here in Tupper Lake, the crossroads of the Adirondacks. All right, so now for our featured event uh, tonight, as always, uh, you'll notice your microphones are muted. We'll have some opportunity for uh, Q&A after the presentation. And as always, this uh, tonight's show will be available on YouTube over the weekend. So uh, look for that. That'll be uh, listed on our uh, in an email next week. But if you just go to our YouTube site, you'll be able to see it. So the star of the show tonight is George Viscomi, uh, educated in computers and electronics. He worked for over 20 years in television. He's a telescope and mirror maker and has made several mirrors up to 20 inches in diameter. He did astrophotography for over 25 years, took thousands of photos and helped illustrate six books. He's gone on to do astronomy of asteroids and submitted thousands of position measurements uh, to the Minor Planetar Planet Center at Harvard. And while doing uh, astrometry, he discovered 33 new asteroids and has one named after him. In the last several years, he's also been involved in observing and precisely timing occultations of stars by asteroids. He's built, uh, he built and operates an observatory of his own uh, right in Lake Placid, New York. So if you're not familiar with the word occultation, you will be before the end of tonight for sure. So George, I leave it to you, take it away. All right, thank you, Seth. Um, and uh, thank you to the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory for having me. We will jump right into this. All right, there are, there are a number of things you can do in uh, amateur astronomy. And this is basically going to uh, cover a couple ways that even from your backyard, you can make a contribution to, uh, well, doing some, some actual science. There are a bunch of ways you can enjoy astronomy. Um, you can do it very casually, uh, just simply appreciate the sky, go out, maybe learn the constellations, maybe putter around the sky with binoculars. Uh, you can have a telescope and be a bit more serious about it and do some visual observations. Uh, I know a couple folks, um, friends of mine who take it actually very seriously. They will spend 45 minutes just looking at a galaxy, picking out details in the spiral arms. You can replace the eyepiece with an electronic camera and do imaging. Uh, I did that for many years, still, still do that. I enjoy it. You can take that a little bit further. And since you are actually, um, recording your rec recording uh, images in the sky, there's actually some data uh, that you can extract uh, and you can take some measurements and you can do some analysis and submit that data and actually partake in um, lending some, uh, some uh, observations to and uh, furthering the science of astronomy. And of course, there's the professionals. And I'm not advocating to anybody to go any route 
all of the above is valid. On occasion, I actually take the telescope and point it to the to some of the nicer objects. This happens to be M13. Just took a snapshot of it. Started out long ago doing astrophotography back in the film days when you put film in a camera and film was not very sensitive. So what you had to do was you had to take long exposures. You had to open the shutter for maybe 20 minutes and do some manual guiding sometimes. Didn't have all this computerized guiding. And on some of my photos, like this one, and by the way, that is M, what is it? M110, uh, the Sombrero Galaxy in Virgo. And during my long exposures, I would see these elongated stars or these streaks. Hmm. Did a little research, asteroids. And during the exposure, the uh, asteroid moved a little bit and created the streak. And actually, there's another one right here. So I ended up being interested in, in asteroids. And what is an asteroid? Well, here's one. This is the asteroid 243 Ida. This was taken with the Galileo spacecraft while it was en route to Jupiter. And got a little little bonus in the um, in the photo. And this happens to be actually a satellite of this asteroid. This um, little rock here, it's about seven, I think seven tenths of a mile in diameter, uh, orbiting around Ida, which is from here to here, roughly 21 miles. And many of the uh, Many of the, the asteroids are irregular in shape. It's only the very largest asteroids that have enough mass and self-gravity to pull themselves into a spherical shape. So uh, many asteroids are quite irregular in shape. This would be a classic example. The asteroid belt. Um, most asteroids lie between Mars and Jupiter. And they lie in a belt, uh, a region here between Mars and Jupiter. The sun being here, Mercury, Venus, and Earth. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system and has a considerable gravitational influence and tends to shepherd a lot of the uh, asteroids in this region here. You'll notice there are few that are around in this region uh, due to the influence of Jupiter's gravity. You'll also see that there's a clump of asteroids right here, and there's a clump of asteroids here. This um, clump of asteroids lies 60 degrees ahead of Jupiter in its orbit. So there's an equilateral triangle that's formed. Um, it's basically, these are shepherded in this position due to the uh, gravity balance of Jupiter and the sun. So you have this 90 degree or this uh, equilateral triangle here and the same thing here. So these are known as the Trojan asteroids. And a little later on, you will see, uh, you'll see a, a video that has uh, something to do with the, of the Trojan asteroids, which uh, discusses them. But some asteroids don't have uh, an orbit that's somewhat circular and stay in this region. Some asteroids actually dip in to the inner solar system. And when they do, they become, and, and if they come near the Earth, they become near Earth objects. They're, they're known as uh, like a near Earth asteroid. When they come notably close to Earth, they fall into the category of potentially hazardous asteroids. Right now, there are 2,000 plus asteroids that are 
known as potentially hazardous asteroids. And the reason they, they are called this, and none are right now a threat to Earth in the next several hundred years, but the reason they're called this is as they come into the inner solar system, if they are near any major planet, like uh, Venus or Earth, they're relatively small, most of them, like maybe 50 meters, 100 meters or smaller. And compared to the size of the inner planets, the inner planets can actually tug on them a little bit. So every time they go near one of the inner planets, the orbit is very slightly changed. As a matter of fact, all the asteroids in the asteroid belt, their orbits are all slowly evolving and they're slowly changing. But especially some of the ones that uh, might run near some of the planets, uh, it changes, it can change them considerably. So a near Earth asteroid that um, isn't um, uh, potentially hazardous to Earth can at a later date become, um, uh, can make a closer approach just because of the gravitational influences. So let's take a look at, um, at a near Earth asteroid. This is one that, this is a, an animation from Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Sun in the middle, Mercury, orbit of Mercury. There's the orbit of Venus. Blue is the orbit of Earth. And this is an asteroid that was discovered in 2013, called 2013 PJ-10. And you can see right here, the, it, the orbit, of the Earth and the orbit of the asteroid are in close proximity. In reality, this is about 100,000, 200,000 miles distance from the Earth to the moon away. But if the Earth and the asteroid were here at the same point, the Earth would, would influence the orbit of this asteroid a fair amount. And you never know, it might come a little closer the next time around, it might come closer to the Earth, it might um, change it so that the orbit uh, does not intersect the orbit of the Earth as much. Uh, right after this asteroid was discovered, I went out and just, just a couple days after it was discovered, I went out and imaged it. And it is this rock right here. The field of view here is about a fifth the width of the full moon. And these are just still images stitched together into an animation. Now, all of the stars that are in this image have precise positions uh, determined for them, ultra precise positions. And you can take one of these still images and you can put it in a computer program and use these stars as reference stars, since their positions are precisely known, and you can use them to determine a position for the asteroid. There's a program that was written by a guy in um, Austria called Astrometrica, and I used this for many, many years to measure positions for asteroids, comets, near Earth objects. And basically you take an image and you load an image in and it calls up a star catalog for that same region of sky and it matches the star stars in your image to the stars that are in the reference catalog. And the stars that are matched, you can see, have little green circles around them. And it figures out a plate scale. And you have an object right here. This is an asteroid. And you can click on it. And in referencing where all these stars are, you will come up with a precise position. 
down here is an indication of how it fitted the reference stars, how well it fitted. And in this case, it fitted my reference stars to about a tenth of an arc second. Now, if you're familiar with what an arc second is, it's a pretty small uh, measure of, uh, of an angle. And I can routinely with this program get positions that are in the neighborhood of 15 hundredths of an arc second. So it's, uh, it's actually a, uh, a reasonably good accuracy, well within accepted um, parameters to submit. And this is one of the things that amateurs can do. And it's something that I do, I still do, though not as much as I used to. What I'm mainly concerned with these days are occultations. And we'll mention two types here, a lunar occultation and an asteroid occultation. Lunar occultations are when the moon passes over background stars. They used to have, it used to be that they helped in giving some, uh, they had some scientific value, not so much anymore. They basically, they are just nice to watch, uh, even in a small telescope. Uh, when the moon, especially when the moon is in a crescent stage and you can see the dark edge of the moon, uh, it's, they're just very nice things to uh, watch in a telescope and they, and they can be predicted. But there are also asteroid occultations, which is mainly what I'm concerned with. And that's when an asteroid eclipses a star. They can be valuable in refining the orbit of an asteroid. They can also help in determining the size and shape of an asteroid and possibly to discover binary asteroids or double stars. And they've actually been helpful in um, targeting spacecraft trajectories, as you'll see in a little bit. And one thing about asteroid occultations is your location on the Earth is unique. They can only be seen from narrow bands on the Earth, and I'll explain that very shortly. But first, let's look at what a lunar occultation would be like. Here's one right here. Um, this is one of the brighter stars in the constellation of Gemini. This is Kappa Gemini. And in a moment, you will see it disappear right now. So that is the moon in its orbit around the Earth passing over a background star. And you'll note down here, there was a time in the video. Basically, this video is shot at one, at uh, 30 frames per second, which means each frame is three one hundredths of a second in duration. And we can take that video and bring it into a analysis program, which we use. You can put an aperture on the star. You can, the aperture encloses all the light from the star and it measures all the light in that aperture. This is a plot of the measured light intensity. This is intensity this way and this is time this way. So the star is at the edge of the moon. The brightness is up here. And basically all this scattering is due to the twinkling of the Earth's atmosphere. So the light goes to right to this point and the star disappears behind the edge of the moon and it drops down to basically nothing. It drops down to the background value. For each one of these points here, you have a time associated with it. So you can extract any time, you can extract the instant that the star disappeared to in this case within an accuracy of about three one hundredths of a second.
but mainly this talk concerns asteroid occultations. Okay, what is an asteroid occultation? You have the Earth here, you have an asteroid, say 300 million miles away. Way, way to the left here, you have a star. Compared to the distance from the Earth to the asteroid, you can basically say the star is at infinity. It's just vastly further away. The star is shining light. The asteroid is going to obscure that light. The asteroid is going to eclipse the star. Since the star is so far away, the light rays are basically parallel. So what happens is a shadow, yes, it's actually a, a shadow, is formed on the Earth, which is the size and shape of the asteroid. Everything's in motion here. The Earth's in motion around the sun. The asteroid's in motion. So the shadow runs along the surface of the Earth. The width of the shadow is roughly the diameter of the asteroid. And let's say you have five observers, A through E, and they're situated and they've got telescopes and they're looking at the target star, what we call the target star. For observer A, the shadow passes south of him. So we get this line right here. The asteroid passes south. This is time, basically. And they don't see the star disappear. Same thing for observer E. They just see the star maintain its steady brightness. But we have observers B, C, and D who happen to lie in the shadow. Observer B is watching the star. And in many cases, the asteroid is much fainter than the star. So in some cases, in many cases, the star will just completely disappear as it's eclipsed. In some cases, you can still maybe see just the asteroid, but the star is obscured. So observer B is watching the star and they see, let's say the star disappear for a second and then reappear. Observer C is more towards the center of the shadow. And usually that means that they see a longer occultation. So observer C is watching the star. It disappears for two seconds and then reappears. Observer D sees the star disappear for a second and a half and then reappear. All of these, these three observers send in their observations to a central clearinghouse, which is a guy in uh, Oklahoma. And they do an analysis there and they correct for everyone's different geographical locations. They correct the, the time. And now with three observers, we end up with six data points. We end up with three disappearance points and three reappearance points. And if you do a simple plot of these data points, you would come to the conclusion that this asteroid is a little elongated in shape. And you could also at this point in time infer a size because you know the speed of the shadow. And from the time, the disappearance times, you can infer a, well, a uh, size, a diameter, how many miles or kilometers. It does help to have multiple observers when, they're, when you are observing an occultation. For example, let's just say I went out and I uh, observed an occultation. The occultation was predicted to be a maximum of three seconds long based on the estimated size of the asteroid and the speed of the shadow. So I see a one second occultation. Now, 
That could mean that I caught the star going in back of the asteroid, or the asteroid passed over the star to the south edge of the asteroid. But it could also mean that the, that the, asteroid, the star passed behind the north edge of the asteroid. So the center of the asteroid could have been here, or it could have been here. Now, if there were another observer that was just north of me, and they reported that they saw the maximum occultation, three seconds, what that would do is that would eliminate one of these circles. Their cord would have been here, and since their cord were longer and they were north of me, that means that this is where the asteroid actually was, not here. And as a result, the position accuracy of where that asteroid is, is greatly improved. Now, one of the things from occultations is, um, I mentioned that I did and still do astrometry. Uh, I did it for many, many years. What you can get from an occultation is it's actually a means of doing ultra precise astrometry because the positions of stars in the sky have been measured to an incredible accuracy. And usually the uncertainty in an occultation is due to the asteroid's orbit. So when you witness an occultation and you can figure out where the asteroid was relative to the star, you have not now tied a precise position at a precise time for that asteroid. And basically by observing asteroid occultations, we can get positional astrometry on asteroids, that is in the order of 20 to 50 times better than the telescopes, professional telescopes on mountaintops that are dedicated to surveying the skies for any moving objects. And if they find an object, they can report a position. Um, there are telescopes that are computer controlled, scan the skies every night looking for moving objects. Usually they are looking for near Earth asteroids, but they also report positions for regular asteroids or anything that they find moving. From observing occultations, we can report a position that's 20 to 50 times better than conventional astrometry. So that's one of the values and why, why our observations of occultations are actually highly prized. There's an organization that is the World Clearinghouse for Occultations. They supply some of the predictions, they organize campaigns, they provide software, they research equipment, uh, cameras you can buy, they make some kits that you can buy to get started in occultations. Uh, I think they were founded in like 1983 uh, by David Dunham and uh, International Occultation Timing Association or IOTA. Need to mention this guy right here. This is the Gaia satellite. This is a big deal in astronomy. Uh, Got to know the the positions of the stars in the sky. And this thing does it. Uh, it was launched in 2013 by the European Space Agency. Basically, it's a satellite that is out uh, at the L2 point, which is where the Webb Space Telescope is. And it has two telescopes. One telescope looks out through this rectangular opening and another looks out through this rectangular opening and the satellite spins. 
And as it spins, it scans the sky, the entire sky. And it is creating um, a star catalog and has created several. Actually, it's on its third catalog right now. Um, it's continuing, continuing to operate. It is looking at stars to about magnitude 20, which is about 2 billion stars. And it's measuring their positions. And since the first catalog was, re was released, it continues, continually looks at the same stars. And it can actually is starting to discern the actual motions of individual stars uh, moving towards us, away from us, you know, left, right, up, down. And you are able to now create from the star catalog in this thing uh, that this is, has created uh, a three-dimensional view of the stars in our region of the galaxy. To give you an idea of the accuracy that this satellite is reporting positions, if you were to take this satellite and put it on the surface of the Earth, and you had the satellite look at the moon, and it didn't have to look through the shimmering of the Earth's atmosphere, you could take a coin, a quarter, and put that quarter on the moon, and it could resolve the distance from one edge of the quarter to another. It's down approaching the micro arc second uh, level in positional accuracy. This is the basis for a lot of, uh, well, almost all the astrometry that's done, the, the position of objects that are being measured in the sky. Uh, they are referenced to the Gaia catalog. And also it's used in our occultation predictions. So this is a, a tremendous boost to astronomy um, in, in the positions that this satellite is reporting. Now IOTA makes available computer software where you can actually do these predictions of occultations on your home computer. This is a occultation that I generated on a home, my home computer for the asteroid 2826 Ati. And basically it's a 16.3 magnitude asteroid that passes in front of an 11.3 magnitude star. Most telescopes can't see to magnitude 16.3, it's pretty faint, but an 11.3 magnitude star is actually fairly bright. You can easily see that in a six, eight inch telescope. This asteroid has a diameter of about 40 kilometers. This is the shadow track across the Earth. The width of this is 40 kilometers, but it's thousands and thousands of miles long. How fast is the shadow moving? These are minutes right here, 36, 37, 38. So in one minute, it would move from 36 to 37. So it's slowly moving across the Earth. We can zoom in on our location on the Earth and do that. Here's New York State. Here's my observatory on Lake Placid. This represents the position of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory. This is the predicted shadow path of the asteroid. So this is 40 kilometers from here to here. There is a dashed line here that is an uncertainty factor. This is one sigma in statistics. In other words, the shadow, mainly because of the uncertainty in the asteroid's orbit, the shadow could actually be down here or it could run up here and there is a 68% chance that it will fall between these two dashed lines. Again, here is a minute mark, here's another minute mark. So the shadow is slowly moving this way. It takes about a minute to go from 
here to here. An interesting thing about this occultation is that, and I recorded this and you'll see this in a minute. I recorded this when a full moon, 99% illuminated moon was less than 30 degrees away from the target star. So this is something that you can, even on a night when you're not doing astro imaging, you know, when you can't record uh, the North American nebula or something faint or look for galaxies, you, as long as you can see a star, uh, you can record an occultation, even when you have bad seeing or something. So we will look at this actual occultation in a moment. But first, I want to mention this right here. This is an example of uh, some of the ways occultations have been used. There was a spacecraft called the New Horizons spacecraft. This was the spacecraft that was sent to go by Pluto, and it did, and it took some amazing images of Pluto. About a year before the spacecraft was to arrive at Pluto, there was a discussion that, hey, if we could find some objects that were beyond Pluto, we could give this spacecraft a second life. We could continue work with this spacecraft. So there was a hunt on to find images or uh, find objects that were beyond Pluto. So when a spacecraft went by, it could then continue on and, and um, image anything that was beyond. They, they searched with conventional telescopes from the ground and they came up with nothing. They got the Hubble Space Telescope on the case and Hubble found three potential targets that were beyond Pluto. They selected this one, 2014 MU69. NASA went out and bought 24 16 inch telescopes and a QHY camera that is uh, quite unique in that it, it stamps the time right into, in, in the camera. So they sent, there were three occultations that they identified where this newly discovered object could potentially pass over some stars. One of the reasons they wanted to do this is they wanted to search around this object to see if there might be any hazards. Um, there are some asteroids that have rings around them. There are asteroids that are binary. They wanted to know if there could be any debris that might damage the spacecraft. They wanted to know what the potential size and shape of this object was. And they also wanted to use an occultation observation to ascertain where this object was to help target the spacecraft. So they tried twice and they did not witness any occultations. Finally, they moved all the telescopes to Argentina for a third try and they obtained, uh, five of the telescopes saw occultations, but they saw something rather odd in the, when they put all the occultations together. This odd, like a disappearance here, re reappearance here. Then they saw a long cord, what we call a cord of a disappearance here. And another telescope saw a disappearance here, reappearance here, etc. So they sat down and they, they plotted these out and they came up with, this must be an unusual, unusually shaped object. It's either, two objects revolving around one another, or it's what's known as a contact binary. Now this is two 
years before the spacecraft reached this object. And at this point in time, from any telescope on Earth, this object was just a point of light. And even to the spacecraft, it was just a point of light. So two years later, they get to the object, and what do they find? They find this. So if you look at this and this, it pretty much matches right here. So they were actually able to discern the shape of this thing two years before the spacecraft got to it and verified that that was indeed the shape. So that is part one of this occultation. I'm gonna play a video here, which will partially tie a lot of what I had mentioned together. And I promised I would show you that occultation of that asteroid um, 2826 Adi that I showed you in the previous slide. On October 20th, 2021, dozens of astronomers gathered near Las Vegas. They pointed their telescopes at the sky and waited for the moment that the light from a faraway star blinked out. It was an event so minuscule, it would have been easy to miss. Yet the data gathered by scientists from those few seconds helped contribute to the success of NASA's Lucy mission. As the astronomers observed the star, it appeared to blink out as asteroid Euripides passed in front of it. Euripides is one of seven Trojan asteroids Lucy will visit over the next 12 years. The Trojans are clustered in two swarms that orbit the Sun at the same distance as Jupiter, though they're as far away from Jupiter as they are from the Sun. These asteroids are remnants of the early solar system, and by analyzing them up close, Scientists can hone the theory of how the planets formed and ended up in their current locations. As Euripides eclipsed the star, a phenomenon scientists call an occultation took place, whereby a shadow the size of the asteroid passed over the region. The best known example of an occultation is a solar eclipse, which occurs when the moon passes between the sun and earth, blocking the sun from our view. Leading up to the occultation, astronomers predict the asteroid's shadow's path across Earth and set up dozens of telescopes along a line that's perpendicular to that path. Spread out under the asteroid's shadow, they count the seconds the starlight blinks out as the asteroid passes in front. Using the asteroid's known velocity, it is possible to calculate its width. By observing multiple occultations of the same asteroid, scientists can catch different sides of the asteroid and combine their two-dimensional silhouette projections into a three-dimensional shape model. Observing an occultation is one of the most reliable tools scientists have to gather information about Lucy's target asteroids and prepare for flybys of each of the mission's targets. The team will continue to observe occultations until Lucy's last flyby of Patroclus in 2033. This second part, is mainly concerned with how we go about observing occultations. IOTA makes some software available to us. Um, this software is called Occult Watcher. Basically, basically, you load it on your home computer and you input your latitude and longitude where you reside on Earth and it will calculate the best occultations that you can see from your location. It's also a coordination tool in that if you select an occultation to observe, and you can select a bunch, you can um, select the ones that you intend to try for, other folks that are near your path will also see that you have selected to try for that occultation and can join in. So basically it's a coordination tool uh, for folks to all join in to try to observe the same event. Now, this is a somewhat unique event in that this is a occultation of a trans-Neptunian object. This is an object that is out beyond the orbit of Pluto. And it's a rather large object. 
And the shadow path runs across or ran across Europe over the Atlantic and then down North America or the United States. And altogether, 135 people around the world, mainly in Europe and in North America, signed up and said, yes, we're going to try for this. We're going to, uh, you know, point the telescope and see if we can uh, see this. So basically, this is a, a coordination tool that IUDA uses. This is the same event. It occurred in November 11th of 21. And this is the prediction that I generated on my home computer. And the shadow path runs across Europe, across the Atlantic, and down across the United States. These again are minute marks. So that's how fast it's moving. From its brightness, they figured this is about 540 kilometers in size. Through a telescope, very powerful telescopes, uh, this uh, asteroid is um, magnitude or trans-Neptunian object is magnitude 20.4, but it was going to pass over an 11.7 magnitude star. That would mean the magnitude drop would be 8.7 magnitudes. Based on the size of the object and the speed of the shadow, this had a duration of almost 21 seconds. So you would see this, this 11th magnitude star disappear for up to 21 seconds. And here is the act, actual recording of the occultation. This is the target star right here. And you see it, and then it is gone. And I record a 10.5 second occultation. So very shortly, it will come back. And it's back. I purposely framed this so that I would have a star that was fainter than my target star, and at least one star that was brighter than my target star. So I can run this video through the analysis software, and I come up with this. This is a plot of the brighter star. This is intensity up this way, and this is time across this way. So the brighter star stays fairly steady up here. There's a bunch of twinkling in the Earth's atmosphere. The dimmer star records along this line. This is a measure of the black background which usually falls right about the zero line. And this is the target star. So it goes to right here and it disappears, drops to the background level and then reappears. And again, every one of these points has a precise time associated with it. So this is a recording of the occultation right here. We can take this further, bring it into an analysis program called Pyote and we get a very refined measurement, which basically says, I know you can't see it down below this right here, but it says the duration of it was 20.5 seconds. It says a disappearance time here, and it, and it states a reappearance time. And it says right here that it calculates my time resolution um, uh, basically time accuracy and measurement of one one hundredth of a second. So it, it found the disappearance time and the reappearance time to about one one hundredth of a second. Now, I send in this measurement. It ends up going to the Paris Observatory, where it's combined with all the other measurements that were made of this occultation. And we come up with this. Each line here represents an observer. These observers did not see an occultation, but 13 of us did see an occultation and we timed it. This happens to be my cord right here. 
disappeared here, reappeared here. So when everyone who observed the occultation is, it's, is corrected for their geographic location, then they can draw an outline of this object. Now this object, Pluto is 34 astronomical units away from the sun. An astronomical unit is the mean distance from the earth to the sun. Pluto is 34 times the earth's distance from the sun. So Pluto is at 34 AU. This object is at 43 AU. So it's out substantially further than Pluto at about 4 billion miles away. When we plot out all, all of our points here, we come up with a shape and we come up with the size measurement. And the size measurement is accurate to plus or minus two miles. So something 4 billion miles away with 13 of us observing an occultation, we've measured the size and shape of this thing to within plus or minus two miles. This object cannot be resolved at, in any way, shape or form from any telescope on earth or in space. So that is some of the power of occultations. This is basically another occultation that was observed, which basically verified a shape model for the asteroid. In order to observe occultations, you need to know where you're going to point your telescope. I use a program called Carte du Ciel, which means sky, sky charts in French. It's written by a Frenchman. You, I've loaded in a da database of all 1 million known asteroid orbits, and it has a star database to magnitude 16.5. And I can type in an asteroid number up here and it will plot that asteroid. And it will give me tick marks for every two hours. And if this happens to be an occultation for a certain night, it will usually show me the star, almost always shows me the star that the asteroid will pass over. And actually, if I click on that star, I will get all the information um, on that star. The NASA video that I showed you, the video that, that NASA used of mine was taken with this little thing. This is a camera that IOTA found that was originally designed for flying on amateur drones at night. IOTA tested this little camera and found it had an incredible sensitivity to low light. And they went out and they found a focal reducer lens that they could attach to the front of it. And this fits in a one and a quarter focuser. So this camera, which costs 85 bucks, um, was used in, uh, to illustrate a NASA video. This is actually no longer made. There is a new version that IOTA is testing right now to um, put in a kit. Altogether, they sell this camera for, um, with the focal reducer lens for about $190. But this is uh, like a little beginner's camera. Here's a, one of my occultation rigs, just to give you an idea of how we go about this. That little camera is in this PVC um, tube. This fits in a two inch focuser. The signal from the camera goes down through this wire, 16 foot wire, and it runs into this gray box here. This gray box is known as a video time inserter or VTI. The signal from the camera is analog. So an analog signal goes in, this puts the time right in the video. 
an analog signal goes out, it goes to this little device right here, which is cost about 40 bucks. And it changes the signal from analog to a digital signal, which goes up to this USB connection, which plugs into the laptop. This right here is an antenna that picks up GP, uh, signals from GPS satellites. The signals emitted by GPS satellites, um, GPS satellites have little atomic clocks on them and they send out very precise times, which is why you can use a GPS uh, device to navigate around town. Um, it's, it, they are all, the G, GPS satellites are sending out a very precise time. So this is the antenna that plugs into this in order to pick up precise times. I've attached a external keyboard and a mouse. This right here is um, usable with 120 volt AC, but the laptop has a battery and I've bought several uh, spares and I can replace this power supply, which powers the camera and the VTI with a battery pack. So this can be made to be, well, you can go out in the field and do mobile recording with it and you don't need 120 volts. Closed up, this is what it looks like. Laptop screen shows up out the top. It helps if to catch occultations since they, are, they run anywhere along the surface of the earth. It helps if you can have a mobile rig. This is my mobile rig. This is actually a small version of the telescope that NASA bought 24 of. This is a 12 inch um, Dobsonian, but it also will track the stars. This is a GPS antenna, which comes down and it's hooked to this camera. This is actually the camera that NASA used um, on the New Horizons occultation. It's made by QHY. It's the QHY 174M GPS. This is just a power supply to power the telescope. There's a marine deep cycle battery in here. And the signal from the camera goes through this USB cord to a laptop. Now, one of the things is you you can increase your chances greatly to catch an occultation if you can go mobile. So I could be in Lake Placid and I could be observing at my observatory and the shadow might, the edge of the shadow may be a mile from me. But if I can move 10 miles down the road with this portable unit, I can put myself right into the center of the shadow and stand a 70, 80% chance of catching an occultation. One of the, there are a bunch of places around New York State that I like to go. Um, one would be the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, if the shadow, hap shadow happens to run there. Um, another location are state campsites, which are great. Um, also state boat launches because nobody's launching boats at two o'clock in the morning. And another location that I have sometimes gone to are cemeteries. So I have caught occultations from being out in cemeteries at two o'clock in the morning. And quite frankly, I haven't heard any complaints from the residents so far. Yet. Yet, yes. Actually, all the little lights in a cemetery are um, at night are actually, um, kind of uh, nice. You almost feel like you have company. <laughs> but anyway, um, almost to the end here, folks. There is an end. Um, getting started in occultations, um, there is a means where if you have a very sensitive video camera and you have a smartphone, you may be all set to record occultations. This is a way to insert precise time into a video with a smartphone. And basically how you do this is 
This is an app. There's one for Android, there's one for iPhone. And you can load it on your phone. And what you can do is you can program it to trigger the flash on your camera that's in your phone. Let's say the occultation was due to hit at 317.00 universal time. So you enter in that you want the first flash to occur two minutes before your event. So 315.00. And you enter in a second flash two minutes after your predicted event time. So 319.00. You start the app. It will count down to your first flash. You start your recording of your video for the occultation. You will see this countdown to 10 seconds. At that point in time, you take your phone and you hold it up to the front of your telescope. The camera flash goes off. That sets, sets one marker in your video. You record your occultation. Two minutes later, this will, well, this will count down to the second flash. So you will see like 10, it coming down to 10 seconds here. Again, you'll hold up your phone. It will insert a second flash in your video. You now have bookends, time markers on either side of your occultation. What the, the apps will now do is they will make a phone call to an NTP, NTP server, National Time Protocol server. And when these flashes went off, they, they entered in a time in your phone, but it wasn't an accurate time. It will compare the time on your phone to the time derived from the NTP server, which is corrected for a delay in cell phone towers, et cetera. And it will, forget this third um, time here, it will enter in two times corrected, uh, two corrected times for your flash that are precise to, I've tested it and to, it's, it's precise to about three one hundredths of a second. So now, well, this is, um, this is an illustration of what you need to do. You need to hold, hold your phone up to the front of your telescope. Well, what, one thing you need to do is you need to, to reduce the intensity of the flash because you can't saturate the pixels of your camera. So I put dark tape over my flash. And when you look at it, you just see a faint light. But to a telescope, it's actually pretty bright. So this is what you get. And this is uh, next to the last slide, folks. This is what you get. Here are the flashes recorded in your video. There is a precise time that has been determined for this data point right here. And there's a precise time for this data point. Since you know these two times and you know how many frames of video you have between them, you can extrapolate a precise time for each one of these frames of video. And you can extrapolate a time that your event hit. This would, for example, be your event. So that's how you can time an, uh, a occultation using a smartphone. It's not the best way, but it will work. Last slide. In closing, just some random notes. There is a document on the internet. If you wanna learn more about this, just do a Google search for occultation observing primer dot pdf all one word can't overemphasize your observing the location is unique uh, you can observe an occultation that a uh, professional astronomer on a mountaintop um, however many miles away wouldn't be available to them occultations can be done under a bright moon it can be done in poor seeing conditions can be done on nights when astro imaging just can't be done. You just need to see a star and see if it disappeared or faded. Since you are now doing and obtaining true scientific data, 
only persons that are willing to work to a high level exactness are encouraged. Reports are submitted, that are submitted get peer reviewed. And these persons who do this volunteer their time. But once you are proven in your work, your efforts can go into updating the orbits and characteristics of asteroids. And last thing I'll mention is teamwork, as you've seen earlier, can play a notable role in asteroid occultation observing. Um, often I record occultations and I'm the only person who observed it, but uh, having one or two other folks observe the same event would be very, very helpful and would obtain uh, much better data. So um, that is it. And uh, Seth has my email address if you ever want to get in touch with me. And I will stop screen sharing at this point. And if anyone's left, um, <laughs> you can uh, ask me some questions. Well, you can certainly see what a high level of precision. So I think that that uh, one of those last thoughts there about the exactness uh, of this is uh, is critical to success. Yeah, yeah, it it needs to be uh, it needs to be done carefully, and the timing is crucial. Yeah. Uh, anybody out there have any uh, any last thoughts or questions for George? I have a question. Yep. George, um, if a person is lacking uh, that GPS receiver that you described, mm -hmm. um, is, is there an alternative to that? Or how precise does your uh, latitude and longitude need to be at this point? You can get your latitude and longitude from Google Earth. You're familiar with Google Earth, right? Mm -hmm. I certainly am. Yep. So uh, whatever Google Earth, uh, you know, you, you, you put a mouse right at your observing site where you observe from, and you look and see what Google, Google Earth displays as your latitude and longitude, that is totally sufficient. As far as timing, um, it is in, in the long run, uh, good if you have a uh, a timing device that is locked onto the GPS satellites. But in lieu of that, um, that method of doing it by smartphone, I mean, I have actually tested it myself and I have gotten um, time accuracy to about three one hundredths of a second, which is basically one frame of standard video. Uh, it's it's quite sufficient. Um, there is written into the analysis analysis program. There is a routine where you just tell the program, "Hey, I have um, uh, my times were are derived from um, camera flashes," and when you are running the program, you just enter the, the times from your that your smartphone displayed as the first flash and the second flash, and the program will take care of the rest of interpolating all the uh, times for each frame of video. Does that answer your question? Sure does. And uh, second question for the benefit of everyone here that may have an interest in doing this, uh, are you willing to uh, act as a, as a coach or a mentor, if you will? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, these events don't happen a lot. Um, the The really nicer events are once or twice a month, and of course, you know the weather up here. So if you get a once or twice a month a nice event, it's chances are one of them is going to be clouded out. But I. Um, Yes, the, they, the, the number of events, um, I actually, when I run my program, I can come up with about 20 events in one night that are worth trying for. 
but they will be of a chance of like 5%, 8% chance that I'm actually going to fall in the shadow. There are some that, um, that they, when they predict the shadow, they'll just say, you got a 100% chance of catching this event. If you are near the center line of the shadow, 100% chance you're gonna get it if you can witness it. So, and uh, I just want to mention to our audience members in response to Mark, George has uh, graciously given us uh, his email address, which I just put in the chat. Um, so if you're interested in doing more of this or asking him for mentorship, uh, that would be a great place to, uh, to reach him. Even if you like own a own a field somewhere that's great to observe from from I'd love to hear about it and uh, just because it would be a safe uh, safe place that I could observe from and not be uh, you know harassed by you know uh, please coming by hey what are you doing uh, something like that um, but I am more than happy to show anybody uh, the basics and and how to do this it's actually it's actually quite simple and um, you know when these things are going to hit uh, the predictions are accurate to a few seconds of when these things occur and they're kind of fun to watch too well george thank you so much for doing this for us um, i look forward to seeing your your truck backed up to our uh to our building uh, whenever you want to okay take these readings. Well, thank you so and uh thanks everybody for hanging in tonight uh, uh and we'll continue uh on september 1st a little bit of a, a different format that'll be our panel discussion on the james webb space telescope and where that takes our thinking uh for the future so with that, uh, again, thanks, George, and thanks to everybody, and have a great night.